Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and I want to bring you a warm welcome from all of us. We're delighted to have you here. Um, we're especially honored to have um, Congressman um, Eddie Bernice Johnson here. It's always an honor when she comes, and we, we are really grateful that she's here. In just a moment, before I turn the, the, the podium over, I thought that I would tell you a little bit about where you are. Um, you're it's sitting in the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, which is one of the 12 regional reserve banks, which along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., makes up the Federal Reserve System. We are the 11th district, if you, if you look at a map of the Federal Reserve, which I hope you will sometime at DallasFed.org. Um, you'll see that as you move from east to west across the country and you count the districts, we're number 11. The 11th Federal Reserve District takes up all of the state of Texas, parts of northern Louisiana and southern New Mexico. It's a very odd shape. Um, you also should know that several people said to me on the way in, um, is this a federal building? And we get to ask that question a lot. And it's, it's an interesting... Um, combination of public-private that makes up the nation's central bank, which is the Federal Reserve System. The 12 regional reserve banks operate as independent entities. They are the private side of the Federal Reserve System, although we are overseen by the Board of Governors, which is seven governors appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate in Washington, D.C. And the two Board of Governors and the 12 Regional Reserve Bank make up the Federal Reserve System, which is the nation's central bank. The role of the central bank, we have two, we have what's called a dual mandate. Um, we are responsible to conduct the nation's monetary policy in the way that the Congress is responsible to conduct the fiscal policy of the country. And our role in monetary policy is twofold. One is to promote price stability, which basically means we have to do our part to make sure the prices don't fluctuate too far up and down, and maximum employment. And if you follow the Federal Open Market Committee statements that have been coming out over the past several years, you know that employment is a big part of what we're concerned about when the presidents of the Reserve Bank and the governors meet about every six weeks or so at the Federal Open Market Committee. Um, one of the things you should know is that the regional banks do not receive an allocation from Congress. Um, we buy and sell securities, and that's how we make money. And what, at the end of the year, when we uh, deduct from what we have made through the sale of those securities, when we deduct our expenses, the balance is turned over to the United States Treasury, and um, the Federal Reserve profit, whatever that might be, is used to reduce the deficit. We realize we have a ways to go. Uh, but we do our best. We are also responsible, um, among several other regulators, of being part of the banking regulation system. So we're bank supervisors. We supervise large bank holding companies, um, as well as state member banks of the Federal Reserve, um, as well as the financial holding companies of foreign banks doing business in the United States. We also provide a number of financial services to the financial institutions. Um, across the country, and those are what we call price services. They pay for those services, um, and we charge for those services, and that all balances out at the end of the year. We also have a fairly robust um, outreach program. We do a great deal with community development, working with other entities and governments across the country for economic and community development. We provide a lot of economic education and some financial literacy education. So. Um, and in this bank, we're very proud, we have uh, a globalization and monetary policy institute that's looking at the economy um, and the econometrics and currencies around the world. So if you want to visit us at our uh, website, we'd be glad to have you look at all the other things that we do here. Um, and I hope some of you had a chance to see our new exhibit downstairs in the lobby area, which has a whole lot more information about it. Um, and now I'm very, very proud to be able to announce and introduce to you Congressman Eddie Greenstone. Let me thank you very much. And before I go any further, I'd like all of my staff that's present to just come up. I want you. Uh, 
uh, to see them. And Larry, you can come too, even though you're not on the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry, who is also a great volunteer. Um, especially when I'm very tired. They do all the work. And sometimes when I'm very rested, they do all the work. <laughs> But I, I came in from out of the country on Wednesday and they didn't stop and they have not stopped and they're the reason why we have this outstanding program. Uh, where is Martin? Oh, there he is right in front of them. <laughs> yeah, and, and there, are, there are a couple downstairs. But I want you, uh, I especially want you to see my diversity. We have uh, Shireen, who is a running American. Oh, and here's Esperanza Artis Worley, who, <laughs> who's been with me as long as I've been in Congress. And Ariel Bradford uh, started out as an intern as a graduate from the University of Texas in Austin, but she's from DeSoto. And she was so good, we hired her. <laughs> and she traveled with me because she had also run the Washington end of the women's program. And uh, Rod Gibbons, who is the district director, uh, Alicia Sherrod, who is the outreach director, and uh, I have to slow down to make sure I get all of these names in place. Joe Green Bishop uh, is our part-time media person, <laughs> and we're delighted he's here. And actually, um, Larry Taylor worked uh, three years before he decided to go make some money practicing law. <laughs> but he still comes in and helps us a lot. And uh, Martin Weiser, uh, his dad was my mentor, Dan Weiser, Dr. Dan Weiser. He's been with us a pretty good long time now. And we have uh, a couple downstairs, but I wanted you to see that I learned a lot from my staff. I try to get diverse staff so that I can learn a lot, because many times, you know, I grew up in Waco, Texas, and, you know, it was a black and white society, and I didn't learn a, a foreign language. I, I took uh, Spanish, and I took uh, Latin. I don't speak either one, <laughs> but I tried. Uh, so I just wanted to share with you that I don't do this alone. And I have many volunteers, which I appreciate very much. Um, each year, for the last 14 years, I, I've tried to bring groups together in Dallas. We do it all year long in Washington. And I try to do it close to Mother's Day. And one of the reasons why I chose Mother's Day because the peace movement in this country yielded Mother's Day when the women, <coughs> after the uh, war against states, the Civil War, uh, came together in order to start dialogue to prevent their sons from ever being killed again in war. And out of that came Mother's Day. So we try to get as close to Mother's Day as we can. Because I started this program in 2001. It was after 9-11. I walked in my office one day and there was a Newsweek magazine that had two African boys on the cover, 12 and 14 years old, dressed in army guard with shotguns in their hands from Liberia. And I said to myself, I've got to do something. We need to build a culture of peace in this world. And so I didn't know where to start or what to do because that's a big job. I consulted with um, Swanee Hunt, who is a native Dallasite, who has been an ambassador, who has a program at Harvard called Women Wagering Team. And she became my mentor, as many others. And um, is Ms. Sanders here this morning for the Peace Center? Well, she's another one that has been a constant uh, person of encouragement. And so here we are for our annual one for 
this year. And I think we have a very outstanding group of presenters. We try to be very inclusive uh, to make sure that um, we hear why and how we can build this culture of peace around the world. I have worked with 86 countries, and many of them are struggling and trying. And that's why I was in Bahrain uh, this week, um, because of the Humpty Dumpty Institute, which is a part of the UN. And if you remember the nursery rhyme where they built, and all the king men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back again, well, I am not one of those. But the Humpty Dumpty Institute travels around the world for dialogue to try to put pieces back together where there are uh, trouble. And Bahrain is one of the peaceful countries that's getting very near to being fallen, the falling apart. And so we have today outstanding speakers, and I have an outstanding moderator. And just I will let her actually uh, introduce them, but I want to express my appreciation for the travels that they have made to come here. We have an outstanding <coughs> speaker from Israel. We have an outstanding actor. Uh, we have an outstanding local leader here uh, right from Dallas. And I just am so pleased and so grateful to them of taking the time to come and be a part of this program this morning. And I'm very grateful to you for being here and, and helping to spread the word, the word that we in America go where we need to go, do what we need to do, but our preference is building that culture of peace, which really starts with each one of us. So thank you for being here.
and of course, our local celebrity, co-founder and former president of Texas Muslim Women's Foundation, Dr. Hindra. Our first speaker will be British Iranian actress and activist, Nazneen Bunyadi. While having an amazing acting career where she has starred in multiple television and movie roles, it is her mark in the nonprofit community that truly sets her apart. As an official spokesperson for Amnesty International USA since 2009, Nazneen has worked at a grassroots level and has also appeared on international TV and radio programs to campaign for the right of disenfranchised populations across the world. Born in Tehran at the height of the Iranian Revolution, Ms. Bonyadi's parents relocated to London shortly thereafter, where she was raised with an emphasis on education. She has done great work, including campaigning with the Organization for the International Violence Against Women Act, which would ensure the United States raises the issue of women's rights in its diplomatic work. Her dedication to human rights activism and her role with Amnesty International has allowed her to focus on women's rights and the unjust conviction and treatment of Riyadhian youth, women, and prisoners of conscience. Allow me to introduce Nazneen Zunya. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Zara. I am so honored and delighted to be here today to speak with you about uh, women's human rights and how the progress that we make to protect human rights is directly linked to our hopes for achieving a more just and peaceful world. Thank you, Congresswoman Johnson, for your dedicated leadership. I get emotional, I'm sorry, because you're such an inspiration. Thank you in bringing women's voices and achievements as peace builders to the forefront. And thank you for your support for human rights protections on many of the movement's key issues. I know you've been co-sponsor of the International Violence Against Women Act, and we are so deeply grateful for your support on this important issue. I'm humbled to be included among this accomplished group of panelists, Ronnie Edry and Doctor, thank you so much for being here today and including me. Some of you may know that I'm an actor and that I use my voice off stage and screen to speak up for men and women who have been abused or have faced injustice, especially in Iran where my family lives. Why? Giving voice to the voiceless is my cause as a human rights advocate. This is why I'm so honored to be a spokesperson for Amnesty International USA on women's human rights. If we can protect and respect the basic human rights that every one of us is born with, this is Amnesty's mission, then ultimately we can help create a more just and peaceful world. For me, the struggle for human rights, women's rights, started the day I was born in Tehran at the height of the Iranian Revolution, a time when the status of women was quickly deteriorating. My parents realized the dangers of raising a daughter in a social, legal, and political climate that was growing increasingly oppressive toward women and girls. And although they fled to London when I was just 20 days old, the struggle for women's rights became a permanent part of my identity. I grew increasingly inspired by the resolve of Iranian women in demanding their rights, women like Shirin Nebadi, whose pioneering efforts for human rights made her the first Iranian to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Women like human rights attorney Nasrin Sukudeh, who is currently serving a six-year prison sentence and a 10-year ban on practicing law, simply for giving a voice to the voiceless and helping the hopeless. Those women inspire me to raise my voice, to utilize my platform, and to remain devoted to securing human rights for all. And yet, despite the many champions and achievements of the human rights movement, every day around the world, women, men, and children are killed, tortured, beaten, starved, raped, and forced into slavery, among other atrocities. And these terrible human rights abuses affect women at a higher rate than men. As human rights advocates, we demand 
that the rights of half the world's population, women, be realized. Women and girls, of course, have the same rights as men to live free of violence, and yet they suffer disproportionately from it. We know that one in three women worldwide will be physically, sexually, or otherwise abused during her lifetime. In some countries, this rate reaches 70%. We know it's rooted in a global culture of discrimination that denies women equal rights with men. Violence against women is one of the world's most pervasive human rights abuses. It happens across the world and in every strata of society, whether it's gang rape of a student traveling on a public bus in New Delhi, or the shooting of a teenager boarding a school bus in Pakistan. In the United States, Amnesty has investigated and campaigned to reduce the epidemic of violence against Native American and Alaskan Native women, who are more than two and a half times more likely than other women to be raped. These figures are shocking, and Amnesty International believes they underestimate the magnitude of the crisis. Amnesty researchers found that on some Native reservations they visited, women told them that they couldn't think of one woman on the reservation who had not been sexually assaulted. Amnesty's groundbreaking report, Maze of Injustice, reports on this terrible situation for Native women. Right now in the United States, introduction and passage by Congress of the International Violence Against Women Act is at the core of Amnesty's advocacy work on human women's, women's human rights. This legislation is critical for the United States to make a stand against this pervasive problem worldwide. <coughs> IVAWA, as it's known by acronym, is a comprehensive bill that addresses this problem across the board and would, for the first time, make gender-based violence a diplomatic priority to the United States. Specifically, the bill would help speed a US government response to violence against women in conflict situations and human humanitarian emergencies. We know that women and girls are uniquely and disproportionately affected by armed conflict. Women bear the brunt of war and account for the vast majority of civilian casualties resulting from war. As Major General Patrick Kamehatu, the former UN peacekeeping operation commander in the De Democratic Republic of Congo said in 2008, it's now more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier in modern conflict. We see the evidence across the globe only one example being the mass rapes in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's as true there as it is in Syria and elsewhere. I would encourage all of you to write to your members of Congress to ask for your support on IVAWA. Or you can take action at the Amnesty website, amnestyusa.org slash women's rights. Importantly, women and girls are not only victims of war, we are also powerful peace builders and peacekeepers whose efforts to prevent conflict and secure peace are critical, yet largely unrecognized, under-resourced, and rarely integrated into the formal peace process. Who among us wasn't inspired by the extraordinary women of Liberia, especially Leima Bawi, the social worker who led the unofficial delegation of women to Liberia's 2003 peace, uh, peace talks and held the all-male delegates hostage inside a hotel room by threatening to strip off their own clothes if the men tried to leave the room without a peace agreement. <laughs> Bowie's movement succeeded, uncommon though her tactics may have been, with the Liberian War ending only weeks after the hotel room siege. In 2011, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for accomplishment. <laughs> but women especially uh, women usually are excluded from peace talks, despite their demonstrated value as peace builders from Liberia and Northern Ireland to Uganda and Sudan. Only one in 13 participants in formal peace negotiations since 1992 have been women. Women have served as only 6% of negotiators in formalized peace talks and have never been appointed as chief mediators in UN broker talks. Amnesty is pushing to right this wrong through its advocacy at the UN and its work with other bodies. Women have untapped power to address the everyday needs of communities in peace talks, and we know that only when these needs are met, 
for education, health care, food security, and safety for refugees and others, can durable peace take root? We saw this entrenched male-only club up close only last year when the countries that make up NATO came together in Chicago to talk about the transition when the troops leave Afghanistan in 2014. The Afghan delegation included only one woman, and we were told that she was there to take notes. <laughs> Not to participate in the key sessions. It was only after Afghan women, supported by Amnesty International, raised objections to the lack of women on the delegation that Afghanistan scrambled to add women to its delegation. Afghanistan is another area where the cause of peace must involve women. Let's return to the terrible days when the Taliban denied women their basic rights, preventing them from going to school, working, even leaving their homes without a male escort. And of course, this is a life or death cause. Some of you may know that a woman named Shah Bibi Saidi now holds what's been called the most dangerous job in Afghanistan. The 44-year-old doctor was appointed recently to become the new director of women's affairs for the eastern province of Lamman. She was the only person who applied for the job, and there is little wonder why. The two previous directors were assassinated, both within months of accepting the job. Dr. Saidi, an obstetrician who has seven children of her own, has not shied away from the dangerous working environment. She operates a clinic in Logar province, which is rife with insurgents. Part of the tiny minority of Afghan women who have gained access to higher education, Saidi sees lack of schooling as the biggest barrier to women attaining greater rights. Without education, women have no way to learn and earn a living and are trapped in their homes, she said. To quote this amazing woman, Everything depends on economics, and economics depends on education. It's the courage of women like Dr. Saidi that inspires Amnesty's work and my participation to see that women in Afghanistan are not left behind in the military transition. Last year, Amnesty was in, uh, instrumental in passage by the US Congress of the Afghan Women and Girls Security Promotion Act, which addresses monitoring of women's security, improved gender, gender sensitivity, and training for the Afghan security forces and recruitment of women for the security forces. In other words, more police women to help keep us safe. But we're not stopping there. We are continuing to push the Obama administration to adopt an action plan for Afghan women, which we've developed in collaboration with Afghan women on the ground, that would keep the US focused on its commitment to maintaining the constitutional guarantee of equality for Afghan women. In closing, I want to note that women like Shafi B. Saidi and many others at the heart are at the heart of my involvement in, human, in the human rights movement. At the core of Amnesty International's movement is the idea that individuals who are risking everything to fight for basic rights need every one of us whose rights are secure to stand by them and fight for them. And women we know are at the front of the fight for basic rights. Women like Jenny Williams of Zimbabwe, who has been arrested 47 times for peacefully standing up to defend the political rights of women, along with her, their economic rights to feed and clothe and school their children. They are true peacekeepers. In the same way, women in Iran have pro proven their tenacity and devotion to human rights. As is true in many countries, women in Iran are at the forefront and they are the driving force for democracy, equality, and freedom. That's why they have been called Shuzan or Lioness, because of their incredible fearlessness in the face of tyranny. I'm in awe of these women. They are true heroines, each and every one. They set an incredible example of courage for their children to follow. Join me in supporting lionesses wherever we find them in the world. Thank you.
amazing when you hear about Amnesty International, which is an organization that all nonprofits really look up to. But the one thing I really hear is that their constant work with women is absolutely inspiring. That there is continuous and it's necessary. So, our next speaker is a woman that has clearly set her place in the nonprofit community. Co-founder and current executive director of Texas Muslim Women's Foundation, Dr. Hindra has been working on the promotion of understanding and respect for multicultural diversity since 1982, when she co-founded the Arabic Heritage Society, a nonprofit educational organization. She has served on the Faith and Feminism Committee at the Dallas Women's Foundation and on the Board of Trustees from 2006 to 2009. In 2005, the widespread prevailing misconceptions about Islam and Muslim women in particular led her and 30 Muslim women in North Texas to co-found Texas Muslim Women's Foundation. It is noteworthy that on its launch in August of 2005, 300 Muslim women attended from 29 different countries and 22 different careers. She has organized as well as participated in interfaith dialogue presentations and panel discussions in schools, colleges, churches, Rotary, Lions Clubs, and international societies. Please put your hands together for Dr. Hindra. for the introduction. I don't know that I am anything special. And uh, I'm not very good at reading or preparing PowerPoint, but I'm going to talk with you. And please forgive me if I mess up along the way or forget something. First of all, I want to say a verse from the Quran, which is the verse that our prophet Moses, peace and blessing upon him, was, by, was taught by God to use when God chose him to go and speak to Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to liberate the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt. Moses said, Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, my Lord, open up my heart, Wayasirli Amri and facilitate my affairs Lisani and untie the knot in my tongue so I can communicate to them clearly what is it I'm trying to say. The first thing is I'm gonna say thank you, Congresswoman, for what you are, what you stand for, what you have been doing throughout these years. We need more people like you who face the tidal waves and are not discouraged from seeing what needs to be done and acting on it. Sometimes it's a lot easier for us to say it's somebody else's problem. We don't need to worry about it. Why create problems for ourselves? So I really salute you for doing this work. And thank you for inviting me for the second time to serve on this panel. And uh, Tasneen, in Arabic we say, MashaAllah, may Allah protect you. Thank you for the work you are doing. And thank you to Amnesty International. Um, Shireen sent me a couple of questions that in my talk I will try to answer. Her questions were, tell us, she said, does Islam elaborate on the role of women in peacemaking? And what are some examples? First of all, I want to clarify something, that Islam looks at men and women as equal. Equal in rights, 
equal in duties and have different responsibilities that complement each other. So women in the faith are not subordinate or subjugated or second class citizens. Our creator in his wisdom created mankind from man and woman and made us into people and nations to get educated, acquainted with each other. And what he says is the most honored among you in the sight of God, in the sight of the creator, the most important thing in this whole world, the creator, is who is the most righteous among you. The book of Muslims, the Quran does not say the most honored among you is the most Muslim, or the most Jewish, or the most Buddhist, or the most Hindus. It's not. It is what you do. How righteous are you? What do you do with this gift from the Creator who sent you here for a short period of time? What are you going to do with it? So our role in peacemaking is actually what should be the role of men. But as usual, we as human beings misuse our authority and misuse our capability and sadly focus on what is here and now for us, what we can get and forget about what is happening to our neighbor, what's happening in our society. In our short-sightedness, we think that we have it made if we don't worry about what's happening to the others. But history is teaching us day in and day out that we are going to pay for it. We may not pay for it right now immediately, but it's going to come back to haunt us. I can quote to you verses from the Quran. I can quote to you all kinds of sayings of the Prophet, hadith of the Prophet, that says, that none of you will be a believer unless you want for the others what you want for yourself. So it's not enough that I look at my security. I think I'm going to tell you about the role of women in peacemaking by telling you about our experience. I think actions speak louder than words. I think I can give you a whole lecture, but it won't help if my actions do not corroborate what I am telling you. I found myself here, and I found myself at every period in my life without my planning. My undergrad and my training is in pharmacy. I was supposed to be a pharmacist. I got married and came to the States in 1975 with my husband, who is a physician, to do his fellowship. And we came here at the time that the Civil War in Lebanon started. The civil war in Lebanon was a devastating thing for me because as a child of Palestinians who suffered from the 1948 Nakba and the diaspora of the Palestinians and who had to live and suffer as a refugee with no, uh, when you, uh, you know, with a ref being a refugee eliminates everything that you know. Because all of a sudden you find yourself deprived of everything, deprived of your uh, environment that you grew up with, of your property, of your integrity. When my parents were going to, uh, to Lebanon, they were in cars, my dad, uh, my mom, and my two uh, elder brothers. The Lebanese were looking at them in the car and telling them, you know, feeling sorry for them, would you like us to take your children to bring them up for you? I don't know how many of us feel, I don't know, I think uh, all I can say is, all I can say is, whatever I'm telling you, put yourself in the shoes of that person. I think that will give you an idea. We are proud people. We are very proud people. Uh, as, as, as Muslims, as Arabs, as Palestinians, you will never imagine how hurtful something like this. When somebody offers to take your children away, to bring them up for you, because they are telling you you no longer can provide for them. Okay. So I came in 75, and I had to struggle.
children with the, the devastating civil war that happened in Lebanon, the country that I loved, the country that I cared about, the country that had everything in it, education, tourism, educated people, cultured people. It had Muslims and Christians living at that time together. There was no war between them. It was beautiful country. I had to live every day since 1975 for 17 years, worrying, worrying every time the phone rang that somebody is going to call me and tell me my loved one got killed or my loved one got blown up in a booby-trapped car or shot by a sniper. I had to worry about my elder aunt living by herself with nobody to provide for her, having to walk in a civil war with trash all over the place, rats running around all over the place. What I knew about the Palestinian refugees in Palestinian camps were being now transformed to an urban city like Lebanon. I had to go through, in 1982, the, the destruction of the U.S. barracks. And being here in the state, being terrified and mortified, what will the American people do with us now? Their soldiers were killed in the barracks. I had to go through the Sabra and Shatila massacre. I had to go through the Kana massacre. If you don't know what these are, please read about them. That was for 17 years. Then we had the Iraq war. I had to suffer through that in the 1990s. Then we had the sanctions on Iraq for a long period of time. Then we had the worst thing, the biggest disaster, the biggest earthquake, which was September 11th. I remember a Palestinian friend called me and she said, Hind, I cannot believe this. We came from here. I thought we were done with the camps. I thought we are finished with it. Look what's going to happen. It's going to come back and haunt us here. If you go on our websites, you, or, or, uh, you Google my name, there is a PowerPoint that I have to present, tell you the whole story of the Texas Muslim Women Foundation in six minutes. It has 20 slides. And it started that September 11 changed our lives. Who are those Muslims? Why do they hate us? Why they are coming here and destroying this beautiful country of us? The sad thing about it is that when they were asking this question, they did not realize that Muslims were part of them. They were their neighbors. They were their physicians. They were their lawyers. They did not realize that the largest Muslim po uh, population in the States is the African-American Muslims. But all of a sudden, it was Islam, it was that weird faith that is blowing people up, that's te teaching its people to be destructive, and uh, teaching them that if you are not a Muslim, you will be forced to become a Muslim. They asked, where are the women after September 11? Their impression about women, and I would like you also to please uh, go on the website and look at photos of Muslim women. In 100, 200, or 300 pictures, if you find five pictures of a woman who looks like me, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> the women who are shown usually are women who wear the shador, or who wear the black scarf, or who wear the hijab. I honor those women, and I respect them. And I'm just saying, Muslims are 1.5 billion people in the world. You have Muslims in the States, you have Muslims in Russia, you have Muslims in all over the world. You have in China, they are Muslims. Some of them had prime ministers. Benazir Bhutto was a prime minister. The, uh, um, the faith itself gave us the right. I am the youngest daughter among three brothers. My dad used to say, if there is a balance, you know, the actual balance. If you put the three boys on one side, put him on the other side. This is an observant Muslim who practices day in and day out. And he insisted, actually, I owe him and I owe my husband the fact that I got the kind of education that I have. I have a PhD in pharmacology and I have a master's in neuroscience. I remember I was working on my PhD when I had my two daughters. And I remember that my husband 
would not allow me to do anything at home. Because he said you need to spend your time working on your dissertation and on your work uh, on this. This is from a Muslim guy. Many of the things I tell you, maybe I won't comment on them. I want you to deduct what is the moral of that story. One major thing that I remind the people about, and I remind us as Muslims ourselves, uh, in the Quran, we're talking about the role of women. The Quran uh, has a whole chapter about the Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary is the most honored woman in history, according to the Quran. The second one is the wife of Pharaoh. As, uh, I forgot what her name is. I'm sorry? Asya, thank you so much. Asya, who did not approve of his um, criminal acts and actually was punished for it. And uh, one major role for peacemaking is, it is the, uh, in the Quran, it's called the chapter of uh, victory, Al-Fatih. Uh, for my Muslim brothers and sisters who are here. That whole verse about victory, came for an event that outwardly was talking about Muslims being defeated and Muslims abdicating. The Prophet went to Mecca wanting to do the pilgrimage and the uh, Meccan would not allow him to go in. They were ready for the pilgrimage. They had taken their cattle, they were dressed, everything. But uh, the Meccan would not let him. The Prophet was very wise. The Quran teaches that any time you seek peace, you will never go to, to battle, you never go to fighting, except when it is the last reason. And you only do it when you are defending a person. The Prophet decided not to push the, uh, uh, the thing further and decided to withdraw. But all his companions were angry at him. They did not want to do this. Why? We, you are telling us that we have the right message. You are telling us that we are right. And you are abdicating. Why are you doing this? He saw the one who gave him the advice is his wife. She told him, all you have to do is go and do the last ritual in the pilgrimage. Cut your hair. When you go out, your companions will know that this is it. And they know that there is no going back on it. And this is what he does, well, what he did. And that solved the problem with his companions rebelling against him. This was a major, if you study the history of Muslims, this was a major historical landmark in the history of Muslims. This was related to a woman. What have we done? Why were we formed? We formed in 2005 to counteract the, uh, for various reasons. We came as 30 Muslim women from all countries, all denominations, Sunnah, Shia, educated, not educated, housewives, uh, Pakistanis, Hindu, Hindus, uh, uh, Hindi, I mean Indians, anything. We came together and we set what our priorities are as women. We wanted to be educated. We ourselves needed to know, is it true that our faith teaches us to be against people who are not of our faith? We wanted to know what happened September 11? We wanted our larger community to know what our faith is, what does it teach us. We had our youth here, and our youth were struggling between their living day to day, and they are Americans, and they're wearing jeans, and they want to be uh, in, in their schools and participate in everything. And we were giving them our baggage that we brought from back home. We wanted to take care of our seniors. We wanted to bridge the community together. We were each in our own uh, small group. If I am Palestinian, I'm with the Palestinians. If I'm Pakistani, I'm with the Pakistanis. You know, so on and so forth. So we formed this organization. The organization, I'm not gonna read for you what its mission. Go on our website and read. But thank God, when we started, people told us, you guys are swallowing a lot more than you chew. You, you, am I about to finish, Shireen? What, what, how many minutes? Um, yeah, about two minutes. Two minutes. People told us, you are chewing a lot more than you can swallow. 
and you won't be able to make it. Alhamdulillah, thanks be to God. At this point, we really have accomplished 5% of what we started for. But every single mission that we wanted to do, we were able to do it. We have, as they read for you, uh, participated in interfaith dialogue, and we, uh, we did it the human way. We did it talking to each other on a grassroots level and build friendships and make people understand who we are and what we are. We broke bread together and we cooperated on events. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have, uh, we are the first organization to actually provide social services for domestic violence uh, that are open to everybody, but specializing with Muslim women. We have opened a shelter, we called it Peaceful Oasis. We have a strong youth group that has participated um, on a monthly basis in community service. They are all over the place. They have done interfaith dialogue of their own. Uh, we have uh, pushed for education. Uh, we pushed for the establishment of an institute at the University of North Texas to teach about Muslim and Arab cultural studies. So you can know about our work by reading about it, but I want to say what the Congresswoman has said and what Tasneen has said. We women are marvelous at multitasking. And we women are marvelous at working with compassion and working with kindness and gentleness and seeking always, always the common ground. The Dallas Women Foundation, one time, when we first formed, brought together Muslims, Christians, and Jews to talk with each other. And they brought an Israeli gentleman to arbitrate. And the whole thing was, he gave us so many exercises to force us to come together. And one of the exercises, he said, imagine yourself in a very little island, and you have the sharks all over you. How can you pack the largest number of people in this, uh, in this island so that the sharks won't eat you. And all of us, we didn't care whether she was Jewish or Muslim or Christian, whatever. We hung onto each other. You could see somebody's arm on the other. You see somebody standing with one foot and raising the other. But we managed in a very short space to pack ourselves together, to save each other from falling into the sharks. Out of curiosity, I asked him, if you have a group of men here, and you were giving them the same exercises, what would they do? <laughs> he laughs. He said, I would have to give them a totally different number of exercises. <laughs> this won't work. If I tell them, do this, they're going to ask me why and how and what's the, what is the, how long it's, you know, all that count. So that's the beauty of Muslims, the beauty, uh, not Muslims, Muslims. And for us, by the way, I just want to tell you that we believe Islam is the basis of all religions. Whether you are uh, a Buddhist or Hindu or a Christian or a Jew, it's the it's the belief in the Creator that made this world out of wisdom, that sent us all here for a very short period of time for a reason to see what we are going to do in this world. Are we going to leave it a better place? And if we are not, we're going to stand before Him and we're going to have to answer to Him what we did during this period of time. Like uh, Tasneem, there is a lady that I really highly respect, young lady like her. Her name is Anusha Ansari. She was the first woman astronaut who went up uh, in, in orbit. She's a, she's a, they call, I'm supposed to say, space explorer. She said, it, what struck us when we were all out in orbit is how small the Earth was. It was that little ball. And we realized that this is our neighborhood and we're all neighbors in it. And we really have to protect it. Otherwise, there is no way for all of us to go. We fight over real estate, but it doesn't make sense. So uh, with that, I'm gonna say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. I hope I answered some questions. <laughs>
from the Bezalel Academy of Art and Design, and since has been a permanent staff member teaching visual communication, both in Shankar College of Engineering and Design, and formerly at the Bezalel Academy of Art and Design. Currently working designer and acclaimed author of graphic novels, he is the owner and founder of Pushpin, a preparation school for the Art and Design Academy. His involvement with social topics and political media has allowed him to have a constant voice with his social awareness posters of many topics. His constant drive for peace led him to create the Peace Factory and the Israel Loves the God Project. His message of peace has ignited an international movement of love between all Iranian and Israeli people. Please welcome Ronnie Edry to the stage. images on Google Images 
uh, when you type Israel. And this is kind of the reality we know one about each other. This is how we perceive one each other. Um, as a graphic designer, all my work is about images, and all perception start with images. So this is the this is the reality I live in. Um, just to give you a scale for where, where I'm coming from, again, this is you in the middle of that big, huge country <laughs> called the United States, uh, Texas, Dallas, right in the middle of it, and all that land, you can travel freely. I mean, no, no passport or nothing, you can go from Los Angeles to New York without asking anybody. That's nice. <laughs> this is Israel, uh, the place I'm coming from, and I'm from Tel Aviv, you can't even see it on the map, it's really a tiny point. Uh, and for me, for people like you living in Palestine, it's impossible to travel. You can you can go nowhere. You, I cannot go to I cannot even enter Palestine. What we calling now, you know, the West Bank. I can go there. I have some friends from Facebook. I, I can talk to them. It's like ten minutes with a car to go to Palestine, and I cannot enter uh, that area. Obviously, I cannot go. I can go to Jordan. I can go. But it's dangerous, so most of us won't do it. I can go to Egypt again. It's possible, but we won't do it. And no way I can go to Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon. The border are closed. I mean, it's closed. You, the, the only option you have is to take a plane and go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Friends telling me, dude, 
That's nice, but not that nice. <laughs> and, and now I have people from Iran talking to me. And it's really crazy. I mean, as an Israeli, because in Israel we're not talking with people from Iran. It's, there is no communication. You can't, you can't die a phone. You can take a phone and die to Iran directly. And in Israel we have a big community of Persian people who live in Israel and have family in Iran. Uh, they can't call them. They, they have to go through internet, stuff like that. You, you can't send mail to Iran. You, there is no communication. It's like two different worlds. And now I have Iranians. I mean, a few hours later, I was posting one poster, and a few hours later, I have Iranians telling me, we see, we've seen your poster, and we want to thank you for that, and uh, understand that we feel exactly the same uh, on our side. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my god, it's, I mean, it was so simple. So I took some of the text and I reposed them as kind of posters, and, um, and we started kind of a conversation on Facebook. The day after, my wife said, okay, now I want to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, she's the mastermind. Behind. She, she just, she realized, you know, at the first moment that it's not just, you know, one poster. It's going to be like, it's going to be a movement. So, second poster is going to be uh, Michal and Mary, my wife and uh, my boy, and then friends of mine, uh, the neighbors, all the neighborhood. <laughs> and, and at some point, some people start to just send me pictures. And that's how we really become uh, not just one graphic designer making a poster and addressing the Iranians, but kind of a, a, a way for people from Israel to say what they want to say uh, to Iranians really easily, just making a poster. So people send me pictures, and I just made some posters, and I repost them on the, on, on the Facebook page, and it goes viral. It, it was really lots, a lot of posters and people. It was like kind of they were waiting for something to happen, and then it was OK to be part of it. So they just send their pictures and their name, and they say, we want to be part of it. At first, uh, Iranians respond with text. And again, as a graphic designer, I'm not really, I'm not really uh, reading. So I understand quickly that I have to take the text and make pictures out of them so people will read it. So we make those kinds of posters really quick, and we post them. This is one of, I think, it, this is one of the first, but this is one of the most uh, moving stories we received from Iran, and we received thousands, really thousands of stories. <coughs> We're receiving them every day now. Uh, this is a story of a woman who has a child, uh, as a young uh, girl, was uh, teach to enter the school by walking on the flag of Israel, of the United States. It's really common stuff. <laughs> Uh, so, in her mind, this is something you're working on. This is the bad guy. You, you, I mean, you understand how they, they brainwash you. And for the first time in, the, in her life, she's, she's watching the poster of me and my daughter holding the, that same flag that she was working on, and she say, oh my god, these are not the people I was expecting to having that flag in their hand. And it changed her mind. And it was just a few days after we just started. I mean, that person was already ready to have a conversation with us. It was, it, it was amazing. And she wrote, now I love that blue, you know, about the, the blue of the Israeli flag. I love that star, and I love that flag. And again, it was just, the, it's still just the beginning. I mean, it, it, every day something new happens. So on that day, we start receiving posters from Iranians out of the salon. I mean, now it was just pictures, but somebody there realized that uh, that text not working, so they got the two posters, and they start sending us their own posters and say, hey, please post those posters on your page. At that point, we had opened a page called Israel of Iran, because it went so big 
that I didn't have enough space on my um, Facebook account. So, yes, they have graphic designers in your room. You were asking yourself. I, I was shocked. I mean, because that's exactly the kind of, of small stuff that you're not expecting from the enemy. You're expecting to be like, ready to kill you, and now you're realizing that they have, they know how to use Helvetica. And <laughs> lot of women take part of, of that project. I, I, I will show you the statistic um, later, but a lot of women send us pictures and at, at the beginning, it was just part of faces because you, you, we were really feeling that they were um, they wanted to be part of it, but they were afraid to show you all the face. So they, they try their best and they send these kinds of pictures. This is my living room at that time. This is how it was looking. Just a few friends of mine come and help me to make that happen. We were receiving hundreds, thousands of pictures and of stories, and we try to report them. And at some point, it become really, I don't know, crazy. <laughs> um, we actually, I mean, really actually had CNN knocking on the door and say, hey, can we interview you? And there, there was a line of, of, uh, of media waiting to talk about that story that was happening in the Middle East, because for the first time, they have good news to talk about, <laughs> you know. So, so they say, okay, let's try, let's try that. And so they sent those good news out of the Middle East, and it was really news for them. And it was really everybody. I mean, it, not just CNN, but the German, the, 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 the Chinese, the Serbian, I mean, the Australian, the French, what, you name it, they came, and they say, hey, can we have a piece of that nice story? And, and to me, the more, the more exciting of it was when, when I really realized it. It's uh, one day we had a, we had an Arab uh, crew reporting in the in the living room, and my, my wife asked them, "Who's going to see?" I, at that point, I wasn't asking anything. I was just uh, like talking in front of the camera. I was like kind of jet lag, uh, and and she asked them, "Who's going to see that show?" Uh, so the guy said, um, everybody? And, and, and she says, um, everybody in Israel, all of the country? No, he said, uh, all the Arabs. So, it was, uh, so she asked, all the Arabs in Israel? I mean, the Arabs in Israel, the, the Arab Israeli, the Palestinians, who? No, so he said, no, all the Arab nations. This is a satellite channel. I think it was El, El Hura at I'm maybe mistaking Al Khuba. And he says, you know, about 200 million people are going to see that show. And I was like, oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> That's a lot of people. <laughs> and we were really actually talking to them through media about that funny project. And that's that's a picture of the TED show, and that's how we really make a change. Talking about images and talking about how you uh, perceive the other side. My friend Dan, he called me on that day and he said, you know, you have to try something, it's crazy. Go on Google and type Israel and go to images. And type Iran and go to images. And these were the first hits. Our posters became the first images on Google search for those few weeks. We actually changed how the world were looking and perceived. <laughs> we actually worked and we, I mean, we didn't do nothing special. We just made posters and post them on Facebook. And, and that's how it works. If it's a solid, a solid idea, a solid story. People will like it, and we will, they will share it, they will push it, and it will go everywhere. And it will, it will become something, and at some point, 
the world will, will, will seize it. So those images were really moving because they were actually proving that an Israeli, and, you know, and there are silly pictures when you think of it. It's just two people holding, holding their uh, passport. It's like almost stupid. But, <laughs> but it's moving because it was the first time it was happening. You had an Israeli and an Iranian holding their passport together, just saying, we can be friends, we can even be a couple, so no problem. Um, we received hundreds of people holding the, the passport. It was crazy. It, was, it became like a trend of find an Iranian and hold the passport with him. <laughs> So simple, and if you don't know the context, it's just you know a young couple. But the fact that she's an Israeli and he's an Iranian that that changed everything. That makes it like gold because suddenly it's okay, it's possible, it's no problem, you know. Um, so we we keep on doing those kinds of projects that I call graphic design project because th that's what I know. Um, that's what I do for a living. I, I'm a graphic designer, so we started with images. We, we keep on working with images, and we make uh, that funny, I don't know, project called uh, uh, Coffee with the Enemy, or Coffee with the Enemy. <laughs> <laughs> that, again, really stupid story, but... So we ask people to send us on Facebook their image of having coffee. So you have here, uh, this is... Majid, and he's sitting is in, in his living room uh, in Tehran, and he's having a coffee, and he's sending, in, sending me his picture. So I took a picture in my living room trying to match the, you know, and, and we make kind of a collage that proves that, I mean, virtually, we can have a coffee, and the next step is gonna be, it's gonna happen, but first we can, we can cheat you know, and make those virtual coffee together. So we had, again, a lot of people sending us, we had weird images of people drinking coffee like that, but <laughs> we tried to get the, the best of them and making those, those images who were uh, trying to prove that we can meet, even if it's on the virtual uh, level. And again, crazy stuff happens. Uh, that same legit, uh, who were living in Iran at that time, and he was, he was the one, he was the first one who really understand that it's, it's not just Israel loves Iran. So he opened a page, a few weeks after we started, he opened a page called, two minutes, my God. <laughs> um, okay, two minutes. Um, so he opened a page called, uh, Iran love Israel really a uh, few, few weeks after we just started. And then we keep on working and we keep on having those meetings on the internet. And at some point, uh, he travels from, uh, from Tehran to Malaysia and from Malaysia to uh, Joplin, Missouri. And I don't know how it happened, but the day he was in Joplin, Missouri, I was at St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Crazy, right? Uh, I mean, really. <laughs> so he called me and said, hey, we have to meet. So he went to uh, St. Louis, and we met in the States for the first time holding our passports. <laughs> so we got it. Okay. This is my wife, and his wife, and this is the whole gang sitting together. Really, really moving stuff. I mean, I met a lot of people, uh, a lot of people who, who opened new pages. Uh, this is a meeting we had in Germany with uh, Juju. She's from Palestine and she opened a page uh, called Palestine of Israel. We have a page by Noah who's called Israel of Palestine. And this is uh, me with Shahrukh. He's a great, I mean, he's an Iranian dancer. Everybody knows it. I'm, I'm going, I'm finishing. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's not fair because I am. Um, 
So I'm, I'm going to just, you know, rolling up to the end and to the important stuff. Um, this is what happened after one year of just, you know, starting with posters and some images. I opened the page on, on the up uh, left called Israel Loves Iran, and then we opened a page called The Peace Factory, with, which tried to organize all those pages that you can see. All those pages were opened just by random people who decide to take part in it. And they opened a page called, you know, Palestine of Israel, Lebanon love uh, Israel. I have a great, she's a girl, she's living in the, in the Dachia, in the middle of that crazy place in, in Lebanon. And she's, uh, she's a Palestinian refugee. She's coming from a uh, Palestinian refugee family. And she often living in, you have to understand the courage of this girl. She's living in Lebanon, and she opened a page called Lebanon Love Israel. Are you crazy? <laughs> you want to get shot? And, I mean, it's easy for me, because I'm, I'm living in Israel, and it's, it's a democracy. It's easy for me. Imagine Najib in Tehran. Imagine, imagine her in Lebanon. Imagine Juju. She came to Israel. Juju, she actually came on the plane to Israel, and she was in my house for one week. It was crazy. Um, so all that happened in one year. These are the statistics I, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to show you just before uh, I'm finishing. This, this proves that and on most of the pages on, on uh, Facebook, you will have a lot of friends and uh, not that uh, big number of women because men are way more engaging in the internet and there will be the like who will like and share. And on our page, uh, the statistics are different. We have 52% are women and the other ones that do more uh, liking and sharing and pushing for peace. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I said that's it, but I, I, I forgot the, the, the last part of it. And that's the, that's the part that you... I, I said I give you heart. And that's the part you're taking part of of the process. I will just take an image, an image of you holding those out in your hands, and I will send it on the page with the words, you know, yeah. Texas, Dallas. <laughs> send this place to the Middle East. So if you like, just to... And then I'm to... Okay, okay. Say cheese.
So we're going to begin our question and answer section. And this question goes to Dr. Giraffe. Okay. Um, what negotiations or conflict resolution solutions are you working on in the Middle Eastern region currently? Um, what negotiations or conflict resolution are you working on in the Middle Eastern region? What negotiations or conflict resolutions are we working on in the Middle East? Wherever we are, we happen to be always invited to meet with delegations that the World Affairs Council or the State Department brings over here. And we meet with different delegations. Sometimes it is just women. Sometimes it is women and men. Uh, last year, uh, we have been invited to be part of the mentors for the Egyptian fellows, the women uh, fellows who are part of the Bush Institute initiative. And wherever we meet and whoever we meet, the thing that we continuously emphasize is always, always peaceful living, peaceful interaction, peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful cooperation. And um, I don't know which part of the countries I try to push for this. Uh, you know about the conflict in Syria now. I'm trying to get the people also to mobilize the women to try to get the different parts, uh, parties or uh, on both sides to, to talk with each other and try to come. What my statement that I tell everybody, I want you to tell your husband, I want you to tell your son, I th want you to tell your father, your uncle, your grandfather that we do not want to solve our problems with arms or with killing. We want to solve our problems by sitting together with guys. And I look at us as a very critical, what do you say, uh, circle in the chain that is going worldwide. We are putting our hands with women from all over, definitely within our part of the world, within Palestine and Israel. And um, very much we, we participate, I've been since September 11, I've been part of interfaith dialogue with Muslim, Jews, and Christians. And at every level and at every angle, we are pushing and uh, encouraging peaceful dialogue. We run into problems, definitely, especially when we are talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict. We always keep it uh, till the end. You know, we have so many meetings before and then we leave those because they ultimately end up with everybody being hurt. If you are a Palestinian, you're hurt. If you are Christian, you are hurt. Or Jew, you are hurt. But the, there are hopeful signs. My Jewish, uh, sister, whose son is ultra-Orthodox and who is part of the settlements that you know are such a problem within the occupied territories, invited me to Jewish community center because they brought uh, students from, uh, I think it was Akka, the northern part of Israel. Um, they were Israeli students and they were Palestinian students. They got the Israelis for one year to study about the history of the Palestinians. And they got the Palestinians for one year to study about the history of the Israelis. And then they brought the students together. The beauty of it, they had about 20 students. By looking at them, you will never realize that these are Jews and these are Muslims. And they ended up, what uh, Ron was saying, there is so much camaraderie and friendship among them. And they said, we don't want to be fighting with each other. So I'm not going to say one part, or uh, I actually will be part of a complex resolution a conference taking place in November. And this lady is working about conflict resolution uh, between the Tamil in East Asia. So women are a link, not just locally, but to the whole world. So what you're basically saying is that the, the biggest thing you want to stress is the 
openness to have dialogue mm -hmm. and communicate at every level. At every level. And wherever we go, this is what we are doing. You know about the problems now in Egypt between the Copts and the Muslims. And I have been also working with those ladies who represented a cross section of the Egyptians mm -hmm. uh, to, to stress to them, please do not accept that we are going to be pitted one against the other because we are Muslims or you are cooks or you are cooks and we are Muslims. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we only have time for two more questions. Uh, this one is for Ronnie. What structural challenges do you see Palestinians facing in their negotiation strategies? <laughs> what, challenges? <laughs> what challenges do you see Palestinians facing in their negotiation strategies? I don't know about the negotiation and the uh, Palestinian strategy because I'm not sitting on those kinds of boards. I just, I just know that as people we have, I mean, people of that area, if it's Israeli and Palestinian, we, we have to do, we have to give the voice to the people. Because That's I right. think yes. uh, most of the young generation, the, the people who live there now in Israel and in Palestine, believes that it's time to live in peace. And any, anyone, I mean, it's, it, it's not just work, it's really, it's really fact from the ground. Most of Israeli and most of Palestinian are tired of war. And <coughs> the actual separation, you know, the actual where where's the border going to be? Everybody knows that. I mean, it's going to be on the 67 <coughs> line of separation, plus minus, and everybody's going to have to make some sacrifice. And it's going to. Be, but we're ready. There, there is nothing more to fight about. We, there, there is nowhere to go. We tried everything. We tried to kill one another, and we succeeded at that for a long time. But it's not, it's not leading to that, uh, to that concept we have uh, sometimes about war, that victory is when you have killed all your enemies. You can kill all the Israelis, and, you can, and they're not going to kill the Palestinians. They're not going to go from there, and Israel is going to stay there. So the only, the only solution, the, the inevitable solution, is peace. So the sooner, the better. Thank you. And this question is for Nadine. In your opinion, do you feel women are really able to participate in peace negotiations? Uh, I think that's up to us, um, each and every one of us. I think we need to make our voices heard. Um, and we can't be told to sit out. We can't be told to not take part. We have to educate ourselves um, and equip ourselves with uh, that strength and that knowledge to take part in uh, things that uh, in many countries in the world we're not allowed to. Um, and I, I truly believe it's up to the individual because when we all come together, we do speak volumes. Um, and you know, as much as Amnesty works to engage women and, and, and empower women worldwide, I think it's really up to each and every one of us to spread that message and uh, make sure that women across the world know that they're not alone. I'm going to now introduce our performer, Kaya Mabasi. 
His label, Cohectic Life Records, continues to flourish and grow in the music scene. Since 2001, his music has been downloaded over 800,000 times and has been featured on more than 27 publications. Besides music, he also holds an MBA in strategic leadership because he believes that knowledge is the key to success. The song he'll be performing today is called My Paradise, the video of which was released on Martin Luther King Day. The song highlights the events covering our nation and the world today, events that existed in Dr. King's time. Please put your hands together for Pine with Austin. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, first of all. My name is Pai Obasi, as you mentioned. I'd like to first thank Congresswoman for having me here. I'd like to thank everyone being here. And Ronnie, I love you too, man. A few days ago, my younger cousin asked me if uh, I could take her to watch a scary movie. I told her why I waste my money and just watch the news. <laughs> Sadly, the world has turned to a scary movie. On January 21st, I released a video called My Paradise that I wrote. And the reason why I chose January 21st was because I wanted to honor Dr. Martin Luther King and his dream. Just like Dr. King, I also had a dream. And my dream is for world peace. So I want to thank Congresswoman for your contribution to humanity and to peace. With that being said, my song. When no war, no racism feels so great. When no greed, no jealousy, or hate crime. A place so beautiful for all mankind. No human trafficking is for the police. Because in this place, there is nothing but peace. We're all the same race, and together, we raise one flag. No battlefield, where a body no one can strike. This place, my friend, it's called paradise. And it's a world full of purity, without temptation and vice. But I'm sad to say that this place does not exist. I had to close my eyes and imagine a place where people coexist. Ah, uh, at times I feel like I'm drowning, broken, I'm so empty, and now I'm doubting. So the only thing I can do is to close my eyes. Oh, it's so peaceful in my paradise.
something to achieve world peace. Sometimes it's just a matter of extending a hand, extending understanding. I believe in my heart that it's possible. That's where I didn't want to. It makes me angry with myself. But I get so worked up when it comes to understanding and people loving each other. We got to do this. We have no choice. We must save our planet. We must save our future. We must look out for our children. We cannot do it unless we love this planet well enough to extend the hand of understanding for all. It isn't easy. Nothing we achieve is really easy. We just have to be committed. I want to thank these panelists. They were so outstanding and so committed, and I'm so appreciative. I'm a part of the United States as all of us are. And as I said earlier, we go where we need to go. We do what we need to do. But I'm convinced that with education and communication, we will achieve peace. I thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming.